It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this talk is Malaria and Global Health. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the global burden of parasitic diseases as evaluated by dailies, review the life cycle of malaria, review malaria risk, review malaria epidemiology, review the five malaria species that infect humans, review key clinical aspects of malaria, review antimalarial resistance, review laboratory diagnosis of malaria, review malaria treatment, discuss the eight prevention measures for malaria and review the status of malaria vaccines. This table presents the global burden of major parasitic diseases. The global burden order is determined by their daily's impact in millions. Let's take a few minutes to review the concept of dailies. The Disability Adjusted Life Year, or DAILY, was first used in 1993 in the World Development Report of the World Bank. A detailed discussion of how dailies are calculated is beyond the scope of this session. A daily is a health gap measure. Daily is a measure of overall disease burden expressed as the cumulative number of years lost due to ill health, disability, or early death. The formula for daily equals YLD, or years lived with disability, plus YLL, or years of life lost. The daily relies on an acceptance that the most appropriate measure of the effects of chronic illness is time, both time lost due to premature death and time spent disabled by disease. The sum of these dailies across the population, or the burden of disease, can be thought of as a measurement of the gap between current health status and an ideal health situation where the entire population lives to an advanced age free of disease and disability. Dailies for a disease or health condition are calculated as the sum of the years lost due to disability, YLD, for people living with the health condition or its consequences and the years of life lost, YLL, due to premature mortality in the population. The years of life lost, or YLL, basically corresponds to the number of deaths multiplied by the standard life expectancy at the age at which death occurs. The basic formula for YLL is the following for a given cause, age, and sex. YLL equals N times L, where N equals the number of deaths due to a disease, L equals standard life expectancy at age of death in years at the age at which death occurred due to this disease in the population. To estimate YLD for a particular cause in a particular time period, the number of incident cases I in that period is multiplied by the average duration of the disease L and a weight factor DW that reflects the severity of the disease on a scale from zero, perfect health, to one, dead. The basic formula for YLD is Incident YLD equals I times L times DW, where I equals number of incident cases, L equals average duration of the case until remission or death in years, DW equals disability weight. 
A prevalence YLD is based on prevalence rather than incidence. The formula for a precedence YLD is precedence YLD equals P times DW, where P equals the number of prevalent cases and DW equals the disability weight. The original Global Burden of Disease Study and WHO updates for years 2000 to 2004 also applied several social value weights in the calculation of dailies for diseases and injuries. Apart from the disability weights, these also included time discounting and age weights. For more information, on the social value weights that are applied to the calculation of dailies, please see the reference listed on this slide. When calculating dailies, health conditions are generally divided into three categories. Group one, communicable, maternal, and perinatal conditions occurring within the first week after birth, and nutritional disorders. Group two, non-communicable diseases. Group three, injuries like road traffic accidents, self-inflicted injuries, and violence. A country or group that has more dailies in the three groups of health conditions listed is considered less healthy than others with less dailies. A goal of health policy is to reduce the number of dailies in the most cost-effective manner possible. Dailies and other composite indicators give a better estimate than measuring deaths alone of the true health of a population. Dailies are often used in global health planning processes, providing excellent measures of overall health status. Calculation of dailies requires prevalence and incidence data that are not always readily available in resource-poor countries. Therefore, health expectancy measures to assess health status are still commonly used in developing countries versus dailies. The top 10 parasitic diseases ordered by their impact on dailies include malaria at the top of the list with a daily impact of 65.5 million, followed by cryptosporidiosis at 8.4, leishmaniasis at 4.3, foodborne trematodiases at 3.6, schistosomiasis at 3.1, hookworm and amebiasis both at 2.2, .2, lymphatic filariasis at 2.0, ascariasis at 1.3, and congenital toxoplasmosis at 1.2. Malaria infects approximately 198 million people, resulting in over 580,000 deaths annually. Malaria is one of five major causes of death in children under five in developing countries. The five major causes of death in children under five are malaria, malnutrition, diarrhea, pneumonia, and HIV AIDS. In the Gambia from 1960 to 1990, one out of every 25 children under five years old died of malaria. There are five species of malaria that infect humans. Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium falciparum, and Plasmodium nolesi. Plasmodium nolesi was thought to be a parasite of macaque monkeys and was used in the past to treat syphilis by inducing a fever in humans. It has now become one of the most common causes of human malaria in Malaysia and other Southeast Asian countries. 10% of Nolesi infections are severe. 1 to 2% of Nolesi infections are fatal. 
This is the life cycle of malaria. There are essentially three phases in the malaria life cycle. Spirogony, exoerythrocytic schizogony, and erythrocytic schizogony. The mosquito phase is where the parasite forms sporozoites that are infectious for humans from gametocytes through a process called spirogony. This mosquito phase is the sexual phase of the parasite. This process of transforming gametocytes into sporozoites takes place within oocysts attached to the stomach wall of the mosquito. Sporozoites are then transmitted to humans via a mosquito bite. The sporozoites are then transmitted to the liver through the bloodstream. The human phase are the asexual phases of the parasite. In liver cells, the sporozoites produce merozoites that are then released into the bloodstream to invade red blood cells. This liver phase process where merozoites are formed from sporozoites is called exoerythrocytic schizogony. Plasmodium vivax and ovale can create hypnozoites in the liver. Latent organisms that can remain dormant for months to years within liver cells and then develop into merozoites month to years later causing symptoms of malaria long after leaving a malarial area and being free of malaria symptoms. Plasmodium falciparum and malariae don't develop hypnozoites therefore don't have a latent phase like vivax and ovale. The blood phase is a cycle where merozoites from the liver enter red blood cells and transform to trophozoites and then schizonts that are composed of many merozoites. These schizonts eventually burst, releasing merozoites into the bloodstream that subsequently enter more red blood cells. Eventually, after several cycles of merozoites, trophozoites, and schizonts, gametocytes are formed that are infectious to mosquitoes when they bite an infected human, completing the entire life cycle. This blood phase of the malaria life cycle is called erythrocytic schizogony. Almost all malaria drugs treat the blood phase of malaria. As previously mentioned, plasmodium vivax and ovale leave latent hypnozoites in the liver that can re-emerge as a malaria relapses months to years later. Primaquin treats the hypnozoites in the liver. So after treating the blood phase of vivax and ovale, treatment with primaquin will eliminate the hypnozoites in the liver and prevent future relapses. The upper left picture is of a Plasmodium falciparum trophozoite classic ring form in a red blood cell. These trophozoites are part of the erythrocytic schizogony cycle and after several cycles can transform into a gametocyte that is infectious for mosquitoes that bite an infected human. There is also a classic banana shaped gametocyte noted by the right arrow in another red blood cell. These banana-shaped gametocytes are only seen with Plasmodium falciparum. The lower left picture demonstrates a schizont, a vivax. The schizont is loaded with little dots called merozoites. When the schizont ruptures, these merozoites disseminate into the bloodstream with each one infecting another red blood cell. The lower right picture shows a vivax gametocyte that like the banana shaped gametocyte of Plasmodium falciparum is infectious for a mosquito when biting an infected human. The upper right picture demonstrates oocysts along the stomach wall of a mosquito. These oocysts were invaded by gametocytes that will eventually develop into sporozoites that are infectious for humans.
The incubation period is the time between exposure to an infection and the appearance of the first symptoms. This table lists the incubation periods for Plasmodium falciparum, Vivax, Ovale, and Malariae. The incubation period for falciparum is generally 12 days, with a range from 8 to 17 days. For Vivax and Ovale, it's 9 days to 2 years due to the latency of hypnozoites in the liver. The incubation period for malariae is 28 to 30 days. Malaria is only transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. These mosquitoes generally remain within two to four kilometers of their breeding site. They like to live and feed inside buildings, primarily during dusk to dawn, factors that enhance malaria transmission to humans. Prevention includes controlling the mosquito vector by use of insecticides and larvicides and practicing personal mosquito bite precautions. It's not easy to eliminate all mosquitoes within four kilometers of human dwellings, emphasizing the importance of practicing personal mosquito bite precautions. For non-immune individuals not taking precautions in malarial areas, the general risk of being infected is approximately 1.2% per month. So for non-immune individuals like many long-term missionaries or other long-term international workers, living in malaria risk areas and not taking precautions, the infection rate may be as high as 57% over four years. There is a significant variation in risk of infection based on location. The greatest risk is found in some of the Pacific Islands. For example, the infection risk in the Solomon Islands is approximately 8% per month. In West Africa, the risk is 2.4% per month. Latin America has a much lower risk of infection, ranging from 0.1 to 0.5% per month. Adventure travelers to malaria risk areas may have as high as a 48.8% chance of being infected. Other tour travelers to Sub-Saharan Africa may have up to a 5.6% risk. The data on adventure and tour travelers was based on the presence of circumsporozoid antibodies to Plasmodium falciparum in blood specimens. Malaria is the number one life-threatening infectious disease risk for travelers. Up to 30,000 European and North American travelers are infected annually. The mortality for Plasmodium falciparum infections in non-immune infected individuals is 4%, with a range of 0 to 8.7%. For individuals who develop severe disease, which includes cerebral malaria, severe anemia, and renal failure, up to 20% die. This table is data from the CDC in 2017 regarding the percent of U.S. civilian cases per region of the world. 67.1% of malaria cases diagnosed in U.S. civilians reported in this 2017 report came from Sub-Saharan Africa, with 11.9% from the Caribbean, Central and South America, 7.9% from Asia, and 0.3% from the Middle East. All fatal malaria infections in U.S. civilians were caused by Plasmodium falciparum, with 77% of fatal U.S. civilian cases coming from Sub-Saharan Africa. Travelers and civilian international workers in Sub-Saharan Africa are at increased risk of malaria and need to use appropriate malaria prophylaxis medications and mosquito bite prevention measures. This data is from a study by Gething et al. published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016. 
There has been a decrease in overall mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa by 57% from 1990 to 2015. Higher rates of death, as might be expected, were seen in countries with low coverage of anti-malarial treatment and prevention. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed a bill that created the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA, on May 18, 1933, that gave the federal government oversight responsibility to develop the hydroelectric potential of the Tennessee River, improve the land and waterways of the region, and develop a malaria control strategy and program for the Tennessee River Valley. Malaria affected 30% of the population in the region when the TVA was first incorporated in 1933. The Public Health Service played a vital role in TVA malaria research and control operations, and by 1947, the disease was essentially eliminated. Mosquito breeding sites were reduced by controlling water levels and insecticide applications. Malaria Control in War Areas, MCWA, was established and operated from 1942 to 1945 to control malaria around military training bases in the southern United States and its territories where malaria was still problematic. Many of the bases were established in areas where mosquitoes were abundant. The MCWA aggressively tried to control mosquitoes that could feed on malaria-infected soldiers in training or returning from malaria endemic areas. During this time, the MCWA also trained state and local health department officials in malaria control techniques and strategies. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, developed out of the work and structure of the MCWA and was organized on July 1st, 1946, and initially called the Communicable Disease Center. Much of the early work done by CDC was concentrated on the control and elimination of malaria in the United States. With the successful reduction of malaria in the United States, the CDC transitioned its primary mission from malaria to the general prevention, surveillance, and control of other diseases, both domestically and internationally. The CDC still works to control malaria internationally. These maps show the progress of malaria control from 1900 to today and some projections for the future. Red indicates high prevalence of infection and risk, Pink represents areas in the process of controlling the disease. Blue indicates areas that have controlled malaria for greater than three years. In 1900, malaria was worldwide. By 1970, Europe and North America had essentially become malaria-free. In 2020, malaria is still a major health issue in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and the Western Pacific Islands. By 2040, the world could be malaria-free if adequate malaria control resources are committed to the effort. This lists some key epidemiologic facts associated with malaria transmission. Major cities in Asia and South America are nearly malaria-free. Cities in Africa, India, and Pakistan are generally not malaria-free. There is less risk of malaria at altitudes over 1,500 meters, or 4,500 feet, above sea level. Above 1,500 meters, there is a marked decrease in the spirogony phase of the malaria cycle in Anopheles mosquitoes, decreasing the production of sporozoites that are infectious for humans. The spirogony phase ceases at 2,000 meters altitude. The United States still has mosquito vectors that can transmit malaria, so local transmission still occurs occasionally, but is relatively rare. 
This is information from an MMWR article published in 2006 regarding locally acquired malaria in the United States, showing the number of cases acquired by year from 1957 to 2003. Notice the marked number of cases seen from 1985 to 1989. This is from the same MMWR report in 2006, showing most cases of locally acquired malaria in the United States were reported from California, New York, Georgia, and Texas. In that 2006 report, the most common species of malaria locally transmitted in the U.S. was Plasmodium vivax, followed by Plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum is a species of malaria most associated with severe disease. Let's consider key information about Plasmodium falciparum for a few minutes. Plasmodium falciparum causes more severe disease than Plasmodium vivax ovale and malariae. Complications from malaria are different for different ages and conditions. This table looks at three groups of individuals and complications associated with Plasmodium falciparum. Non-pregnant adults have more jaundice, renal failure, and pulmonary edema. Children experience more anemia, seizures, and hypoglycemia. Pregnant women, unfortunately, have essentially the worst of both groups with anemia, hypoglycemia, jaundice, renal failure, and pulmonary edema. Pregnant women have fewer seizure complications compared with children. Pregnancy and malaria is not a good combination. Plasmodium falciparum resistance to chloroquine is common worldwide. There are some chloroquine sensitive areas still in Latin America, South America, the Middle East, and Egypt. Thailand and the Mekong Delta region of Southeast Asia has been an epicenter of multi-drug resistant malaria. Thailand noticed multi-drug resistant Plasmodium falciparum as early as 1992 with a 60 to 70% resistance to mefloquine and 50 to 60 percent to quinine. Knowing the current prevalence of malaria resistance in malaria risk areas is extremely important for developing effective malaria prophylaxis and treatment strategies. This is a study from Haiti reported in Emerging Infectious Diseases in May 2009. Threonine at position 76 of the Plasmodium falciparum resistance transporter gene, PFCRTG, is associated with chloroquine resistance. In this Haitian study, Plasmodium falciparum was diagnosed for 79 persons with blood smear or rapid diagnostic tests, RDT, and confirmed by polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Nine specimens were subsequently tested for this chloroquine resistance gene. Five of those nine specimens had the Plasmodium falciparum resistance transporter gene, PFCRTG, indicating chloroquine resistant Plasmodium falciparum organisms in Haiti. Gene technology can be a valuable tool for identifying antimalarial resistance. This is an interesting article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006, discussing a public health policy approach to reverse anti-malarial resistance. This was a research clinical study in the Ndurande District Health Center in Blantyre, Malawi. In 1993, Malawi implemented a national policy discontinuing the use of chloroquine for the treatment of malaria due to chloroquine resistance rates of greater than 50% for Plasmodium falciparum and replaced chloroquine with Fancidar, sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. A genetic marker was used to monitor resistance. 
the plasmodium falciparum chloroquine resistant transport gene, PFCRTG. The resistance rates decreased to non-detectable after 12 years of implementation. Clinical response to chloroquine paralleled the PFCRTG gene markers. Surrounding countries where chloroquine was still being used had chloroquine resistance rates as high as 90%. Clinical response to chloroquine paralleled the PFCRTG gene markers. Anti-malarial medication control policies can result in reversal of resistance. Let's now consider Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium vivax is the most common cause of malaria worldwide, commonly seen in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Central and South America. Plasmodium vivax is not as lethal as Plasmodium falciparum. The general chloroquine resistance rate for vivax is 12.5%. There is a higher prevalence of resistance in New Guinea, Indonesia, and Irian Jaya, and resistance is primarily seen in those less than four years old. Let's now briefly discuss Plasmodium ovale, Malariae, and Nolesi. Plasmodium ovale is primarily seen in West Africa, including the countries of Nigeria, Santome, and Sierra Leone. It has also been identified in Uganda and Myanmar. There are two different genetic forms of Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium ovale curtisi and Plasmodium ovale wallacheri. Plasmodium malariae is seen in Southeast Asia and tropical Africa. Plasmodium malariae is associated with clinical recrudescences for up to 20 years with mild or few symptoms, but can eventually result in chronic renal failure. Plasmodium nolesi is seen in Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesian Borneo, and Singapore. Approximately 10% of individuals infected with Plasmodium nolesi will have severe disease. The mortality rate with Plasmodium nolesi is approximately 1 to 2 percent. Malaria commonly presents with flu-like symptoms of fever, headache, arthralgias, particularly backache, vomiting, and mild diarrhea. Fever spikes are initially irregular, but then transition to spike in a regular tertiary or quartan pattern. Diarrhea can confuse clinicians who may look for a gastrointestinal cause for the illness versus malaria. This graph demonstrates the classic tertiary and quartan fever spikes of various malaria organisms that correlates with the release of merozoites from schizons. Plasmodium falciparum, vivax, and ovale spike in a tertiary pattern, day one and then days three, five, seven, etc. Plasmodium malariae fevers spike in a quartan pattern, day one, then days four, seven, ten, etc. Initially, malaria fevers are irregular and then transition to a tertiary or quartan pattern. Fever is generally associated with the parasite load with temps greater than 38.5 centigrade associated with parasitemia greater than 180 per microliter. Yet the fever threshold varies with the infecting strain of malarial organisms. As reported in 2002 in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, Plasmodium falciparum strain A on this slide had a fever threshold of 75 organisms per microliter versus strain B with a threshold of 1,800 organisms per microliter. Fever in tropical areas, particularly in rural clinics, is often diagnosed as malaria and presumptively treated. Is malaria the main cause of fever in malaria endemic areas? A Tanzanian outpatient clinical study of fever in children under 10 years old 
was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. Fever was defined as a temperature of 38 degrees centigrade or higher. The patients came from two outpatient clinics, one rural, one urban. Evaluation consisted of a clinical examination and blood and nasopharyngeal specimens for rapid diagnostic tests, serology cultures, and molecular tests. This table summarizes the results of that study of Tanzanian children with fever. 10.5% had malaria, leaving 89.5% with other etiologies for their fever. Acute respiratory infection was by far the most common cause of fever, followed by systemic infection other than malaria or typhoid fever at 13.3%. Typhoid fever was the cause of fever in 3.7%. So malaria may not be the major cause of fever in children in malaria endemic areas. This study was of Tanzanian children, but likely could apply to many other regions of the world. The World Health Organization's definition of severe malaria includes cerebral malaria that presents with unarousable coma, severe anemia that includes a low hemoglobin, less than five, low hematocrit, less than 15, high parasite counts greater than 10,000, and the percent of red blood cells that are infected. Increased fatality is seen when greater than 2% of red blood cells are infected. Plasmodium vivax ovale and malariae almost never have more than 1% of red blood cells infected. Renal failure also defines severe malaria. Plasmodium falciparum is the most common malaria species causing severe malaria. Other signs and symptoms of severe malaria include pulmonary edema or adult respiratory distress syndrome, hypoglycemia less than 40 milligrams per deciliter, Hypoglycemia is more common in pregnant women treated with the anti-malarial drug quinine that increases insulin release, which decreases blood glucose levels. Children tend to have more hypoglycemia than adults. Circulatory collapse or shock, that would include a systolic blood pressure of less than 50 for children one to five years old or less than 70 for adults spontaneous bleeding or lab evidence of disseminated intravascular coagulation, repeat general seizures greater than two per 24 hours, acidosis with an arterial pH of 7.25 and bicarbonate level of less than 15 millimoles per liter, and macroscopic hemoglobinuria. Other clinical complications of malaria include nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is more commonly seen in children with malaria than adults. Nephrotic syndrome has been described with plasmodium malariae due to antigen antibody complexes that develop during the chronic nature of infection with this organism. Plasmodium malariae infections can last up to 20 years. This is a summary of a study reported in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in 2002 that pointed out the association of thrombocytopenia with death in children. This was a study of 0 to 15 year olds in Senegal, West Africa. When those kids had platelet counts less than 100,000 per cubic millimeter, the odds ratio for death was 6.31 or 6.31 times higher than those with normal platelet levels. Another study reported in May 2011 in the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases demonstrated that thrombocytopenia is almost universally seen in children with plasmodium nolesi infections. The average platelet count in childhood Plasmodia falciparum infections is 156,000 per microliter versus 76,500 with Plasmodium nolesi. 
This is the summary of a 2014 article from the New England Journal of Medicine. They studied 802 Tanzanian children with malaria. Of those 802 children, 102 had severe malaria. More than half of the severe malaria cases occurred after the second malaria infection. Generally, parasite levels were higher when children had severe versus mild disease, but not consistently. The incidence of severe malaria decreased considerably after infancy. Severe malaria risk and increased parasite density was associated with non-use of bed nets, placental malaria at the time of a woman's second or subsequent pregnancy, high transmission season, and absence of sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait is a malaria protective factor. Cerebral involvement is the major cause of mortality with malaria infection. Coma is the most frequent manifestation of severe malaria. Seizures are seen in about 50% of cerebral malaria cases. Symptoms and signs of cerebral malaria are caused by endothelial damage and vasculitis of small blood vessels in the brain. Plasmodium falciparum develops sticky knobs on infected red blood cells as pictured. These knobs adhere like glue to the endothelial lining of blood vessels and obstruct blood flow and cause vasculitis, causing cerebral signs and symptoms. In cerebral malaria, no organisms are found in cerebral spinal fluid specimens since there is no invasion of brain tissue or meninges. Cerebral malaria is a vascular disease. Acute renal failure can be seen with malaria and is most commonly seen with Plasmodium falciparum, but can also be seen with Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium malariae. Blackwater fever can be seen prior to the onset of renal failure and is due to hemolysis of infected red blood cells causing dark brown urine due to the myoglobin release during the process of red cell destruction. Most individuals with blackwater fever resolve without complications, but some may progress to renal failure. An ominous sign of serious renal problems is oliguria or decreased urine output. Treatment of a patient who has glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase G6PD deficiency with primaquine or the use of quinine in treating severe disease, often in subtherapeutic doses, can lead to renal failure. Primaquine increases oxidative stress, resulting in enhanced hemolysis of G6PD deficient red blood cells. Primaquine associated hemolysis in G6PD deficiency is dose dependent. One dose will likely not cause problems, but multiple doses like the 14-day therapeutic course used to treat the latent hypnozoic phase of Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale may be associated with a significant risk of hemolysis. These latter patients should be screened for G6PD deficiency before treating with primaquine. G6PD deficiency is an X-linked inherited genetic mutation conferring varying degrees of G6PD deficiency to affected individuals. G6PD deficiency is prevalent throughout malaria endemic regions. Primaquine is the only available antimalarial drug that kills the dormant liver phase of Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale, preventing relapse and providing a radical cure. It is also the only generally available antimalarial that rapidly sterilizes mature Plasmodium falciparum gametocytes that are the infectious form of Plasmodium falciparum for the mosquito. Chronic malaria is likely due to recurrent infections in endemic areas. Symptoms and signs of chronic malaria include anemia and splenomegaly. 
Splenomegaly is common in children in endemic areas and is a good estimate of malaria prevalence. Splenomegaly is due to an exaggerated immune response. Splenomegaly responds to antimalarial therapy. This chronic splenomegaly caused by malaria is commonly referred to as tropical splenomegaly syndrome. Malaria infection during pregnancy is associated with an increased mortality and low birth weight for the baby. Congenital transfer of malaria via blood can occur during pregnancy causing congenital malaria in the baby. This is primarily associated with vivax and occurs in 16 to 34 percent of cases where the mother is infected. Since the blood phase of malarial organisms are the only ones transferred to the baby during pregnancy, the baby has no latent hypnozoites when the mother is infected with vivax or ovale. Therefore, the baby will only need to be treated with antimalarials that treat the blood phase of the organism. Congenital malaria is more common in non-immune mothers who have a 7.4% chance of transmitting the infection to their baby versus non-immune mothers at 0.3%. The onset of symptoms in congenital malaria is approximately 3 to 5.5 weeks post-birth. Treatment would be an appropriate blood phase antimalarial drug. Major complications of malaria are more common in women during their first pregnancy, primiparous pregnant women. Major malaria complications in pregnancy include hypoglycemia, anemia, and pulmonary edema or adult respiratory distress syndrome. Malaria is a major concern for pregnant women in malaria endemic areas. Pregnant women should avoid travel to malaria endemic areas. The gold standard for the lab diagnosis of malaria is seeing the organisms on thin and thick smears. Polymerase chain reaction PCR is a helpful test that can provide results within several hours. PCR in many reference labs like the CDC lab has a sensitivity and specificity of essentially 100%. PCR can differentiate malarial species. PCR may be most helpful in Plasmodium vivax, ovale, and malariae since they tend to have much lower parasite counts than falciparum. This is particularly true of malariae with very low counts for up to 20 years and minimal symptoms. Let's briefly discuss rapid diagnostic tests for malaria. There are at least 30 plus malaria rapid diagnostic tests, RDT kits, available. Sensitivity ranges from 65 to 97% and specificity from 87 to 100%. Sensitivity and specificity of RDTs are still below that of microscopy. RDTs are helpful where high quality microscopic services are not readily available. A major advantage is that results can be provided within 10 to 15 minutes for many of these kits. There are several disadvantages. RDTs may not detect low parasite counts. Low parasite counts are not unusual for Plasmodium vivax, ovale, and malariae. There is incomplete data on the ability of RDTs to detect Plasmodium ovale and Plasmodium malariae. RDTs generally detects two antigens, Plasmodium falciparum and one general antigen that detects the four major malarial organisms, Plasmodium falciparum, Vivax ovale, and malariae. All negative RDTs must be confirmed by microscopy. Positive tests must use microscopy to determine species and quantify the parasite load, which is important for clinical prognostic reasons. Let's now discuss the basic concepts of treatment. 
Dosing details are complex and beyond the scope of this session. For more dosing information, refer to references listed on this slide. The Red Book, Report of the Committee on Infectious Diseases, American Academy of Pediatrics, and the CDC Malaria Treatment Guidelines. This table lists commonly used medications for treating malaria. All medications treat the blood phase except primaquin that focuses on the latent phase hypnozoites in the liver for Plasmodium vivax and ovale. Blood phase medications include chloroquine and hydrochloroquine, etavoquone proguanol, brand name malarone, artesunate, doxycycline, tetracycline, clindamycin, artemeter, lumefantrine, brand names coartum and reamet, quinine, quinidine, and mefloquine. The five medications used for prophylaxis or to prevent malaria include mefloquine, chloroquine, doxycycline, adivoquone proguanol, malarone, and primaquine. Choice of medication, dose, and route of administration is dependent on several factors, including severity of the illness, age, underlying medical conditions, i.e. pregnancy, G6PD status, etc., anti-malarial resistance patterns for the region, and the malaria species being treated. This table lists other potentially promising anti-malarials. Tefenoquin is related to primaquin and has been used to treat several patients successfully with plasmodium vivax. Amodiaquin is a 4-aminoquinolone that has been used to treat Plasmodium falciparum. Spiroindolone was demonstrated to clear Plasmodium vivax and falciparum faster than artesunate in a study in Thailand. Imidazole piperazine is active against the blood and liver stages of malaria and has been studied in adults with uncomplicated plasmodium vivax and falciparum. Let's spend a few minutes discussing antimalarial drug resistance. There are four categories of resistance, none, R1, R2, or R3. The red line represents no resistance. In this situation, organisms decline to zero with treatment and stay that way as seen by no organisms detected at seven or 28 days. R1 resistance is the yellow line and R2 resistance the green line. In R1 resistance, the organisms decline rapidly, often up to 75% within 48 hours, but never approach zero. So all the organisms aren't eliminated and within seven days rise in R2 and in 28 days for R1. This rise in R1 and R2 resistance is a recrudescence of the infection since the organisms were never totally eliminated from the body by treatment. Recrudescence occurs when the organism is never eliminated from the blood. This can occur with all malarial organisms. Relapse is where the organism is eliminated from the blood, but later reemerges from the liver. Relapse can only occur with Plasmodium vivax and ovale that have latent hypnozoites in the liver. R3 resistance is essentially seen when there is no response to treatment. You can see the importance of checking parasite counts at 24 and 48 hours, but also at 7 and 28 days to determine if there is resistance and of what type. Artemisinin compounds are major drugs used to treat Plasmodium falciparum infections, including severe disease. Artemisinin resistance for Plasmodium falciparum is increasing across mainland Southeast Asia, mainly from Southern Vietnam to Central Myanmar. This resistance is due to mutation of the propeller region of chromosome 13 called Kelch 13. Prolonged courses of artemisinin-based combination therapies, artesunate times three days, then three days of dihydroartemisinin piperiquin, are currently efficacious. 
At 42 days, the failure rate was 2%. A three-day course of dihydroartemisinin and piperiquin had a failure rate of 25%. Let's consider antimalarial efficacy for a few minutes. This is a study published in 2005 of the efficacy of a variety of antimalarial regimens used to treat uncomplicated malaria in two communities of Angola in 2002 and 2003. As expected, the chloroquine failure rate was high at 83.5% due to chloroquine resistance. Fancidar, which is a combination of sulfadoxine and pyrimethamine, had a moderately high failure rate of 25.3%. Due to this moderately high failure rate, Fancidar is no longer recommended for malarial treatment. Amodiaquin as monotherapy had a moderate failure rate of 20%. The artemisinin-based combinations, which added amodiaquin or Fancidar, had a very low failure rate of 1.2%. The artemisinin combination regimens have a much lower failure rate in the treatment of uncomplicated malaria in this area of West Africa. This table shows the efficacy of four antimalarial regimens used to treat Plasmodium falciparum. Malarone was 100% effective versus 81 to 88% for mefloquine, amodiaquine, and chloroquine plus Fancidar. This table reviews the results of several studies regarding the treatment of multi-drug resistant malaria in Thailand. All of these treatment regimens were quite effective with efficacy ranging from 95% with the combination drug Artemitor Lumifantrine to 98 to 100% with quinine plus doxycycline and adivacuone proguanal malarone. There was an increased recurrence noted when artesunate was used alone. Therefore, the World Health Organization recommends using a combination of artemisinin with a second agent to avoid recurrence and the emergence of resistance. So currently, there are good regimens to treat uncomplicated and multi-drug resistant malaria. Let's now turn our attention to the prevention of malaria. Simple prevention techniques can be 98% effective in preventing malaria. These prevention strategies will also significantly impact not only malaria, but many other mosquito-borne illnesses. As mentioned previously, without precautions or anti-malarial prophylaxis, the infection rate for non-immune individuals is approximately 1.2% per month or 14.4% per year. These are eight prevention measures for malaria that, if used appropriately, can reduce malaria transmission by 98%. 1. Use insect repellents from dusk to dawn. 2. Use insecticide sprays containing pyrethrum. 3. Use permethrin impregnated bed nets and clothing. 4. Wear blousy, long sleeve shirts and pants. Five, stay in mosquito-free screened areas from dusk to dawn. Six, use appropriate prophylactic medications. Seven, cover water containers. And eight, use larvicides. Insect repellents should be used from dusk to dawn, the main feeding time for Anopheles mosquitoes. Insect repellents to consider include DEET, NN diethyl metatoluamide, picaridin, and oil of lemon eucalyptus. Oil of lemon eucalyptus works well and lasts as long as low dose DEET. DEET may be used on adults, children, and infants older than two months of age. 
Adults should consider using DEET products up to a DEET concentration of 50%. Higher concentrations of DEET may have a longer repellent effect, but concentrations over 50% provide no added protection. DEET can be used on children greater than two months old in concentrations from 10 to 30%. Some experts recommend less than 12% DEET for children, though others feel that children can safely use up to 30% DEET if used appropriately. When using repellent with DEET, follow these recommendations. Read and follow all directions and precautions on the product label. Avoid over application of the product. To apply to the face, first spray the product onto hands, then rub onto the face. Use only when outdoors and wash skin with soap and water after coming indoors. Use just enough repellent to cover exposed skin and or clothing. Protect infants from mosquito bites by using a carrier draped with mosquito netting with an elastic edge for a tight fit. Store DEET out of the reach of children. Do not allow children under 10 years of age to apply repellent themselves. Do not apply to young children's hands or around eyes and mouth. Do not breathe in, swallow, or apply DEET near the eyes. Do not put repellent on wounds or broken skin. This is a review of studies from 2003 and 2004 comparing picaridin with DEET from South Africa, Burkina Faso, and Australia. In three of the studies, picaridin is at least as effective as DEET. The South African study shows a greater drop in efficacy for picaridin after one hour versus DEET. The Australian study shows picaridin against Anopheles species to possibly be somewhat better than 20% DEET, but similar to 35% DEET. Picaridin seems to be generally as effective as DEET. These studies are with concentrations in the 20% range. The efficacy of a 7% formulation currently sold in the U.S. is not known. Unlike DEET, Picaridin is odorless, does not feel greasy or sticky, and is less likely to irritate the skin and does not damage plastics or fabrics. Long-term safety of picaridin is currently not known. Two, use insecticide sprays containing pyrethrum. Pyrethrum kills on contact. Consider using pyrethrum containing sprays in living rooms and bedrooms in the evening when Anopheles mosquitoes feed. Three, use permethrin impregnated bed nets and clothing. Permethrin binds to fabrics and will continue to repel mosquitoes even after several washings. Four, wear blousy long sleeve shirts and pants. Five, Stay in mosquito-free screened areas from dusk to dawn. This is a technique for permethrin application to bed nets and clothing. Do not let the liquid come in contact with bare skin. Wear gloves. Permethrin binds tightly to fabrics and will continue to repel mosquitoes for six months to a year, even with repeated washing. Use a permethrin-containing solution with a concentration of about 15%. Cow dip solutions to control ticks has a concentration of approximately this percent. Pour the permethrin solution into a large plastic bag with water to make a final concentration of 2%. Place rolled fabric in the bag and gently shake two times and then let it rest for 2.5 hours. Remove the roll of fabric, hang to dry for at least three hours. Number six is use appropriate prophylactic medications based on anti-malarial resistance patterns in the endemic area and medication contraindications. Generally, if in a chloroquine sensitive area, use chloroquine. Mefloquine and malarone, out of Aquone proguanal, 
are some of the most common medications used for most malaria risk areas of the world. For mefloquine, larium, chloroquine, and doxycycline, start prophylaxis one week prior to travel and continue for four weeks after leaving the endemic area. For adivoquone, proguanol, malarone, and primaquine, start one day prior to travel and continue for seven days after leaving endemic areas. Malarone is a good choice for shorter trips since it started only one to two days before travel versus one week and is continued for only seven days after travel rather than four weeks. Mefloquine is given in a weekly dose versus malarone taken daily. The weekly dose of mefloquine may enhance compliance. Primaquine is a causal prophylactic medication since it treats the liver phase of the parasite before it reaches the blood. Contraindications for primaquine prophylaxis include G6PD deficiency previously discussed and pregnancy. Other potential malaria prophylactic drugs include tefenequine and azithromycin. This table summarizes antimalarial prophylactic efficacy from several studies. The best prophylactic regimens are malarone, doxycycline, primaquine, and mefloquine. Many individuals complain of mefloquine adverse reactions. About 18.8% of individuals taking mefloquine for prophylaxis will have side effects. The most common side effects are nausea, headache, dizziness, skin problems, and insomnia. Major mefloquine concerns are the relatively rare but significant neuropsychologic issues. One of 200 to one of 500 have neuropsychologic problems, nightmares, anxiety, irritability, and depression. One of 10,000 to one of 13,000 develop psychosis or seizures. Those that develop psychosis or seizures usually have a previous history of those complications. One of 100 to one of 1,500 develop psychosis or seizures when mefloquine is used for treatment since treatment doses are higher than those for prophylaxis. Mefloquine is contraindicated with a history of epilepsy or psychiatric disorders. Mefloquine is safe in pregnancy after the first trimester. Even though there has been no increased teratogenicity or spontaneous abortions, even when used in the first trimester, it is probably safe, though not yet approved by the FDA. It's clinically prudent to start mefloquine two weeks prior to travel, providing time to observe for significant neuropsychiatric reactions and make medication changes if necessary. Number seven is cover water containers to decrease breeding sites near houses. There can be a role for larvicides, number eight, but they will likely have a limited impact since Anopheles mosquitoes can travel up to four kilometers to feed. Therefore, to be effective, all standing water within that four kilometer radius would need to be treated with larvicide, which would be difficult in most malaria endemic areas. This slide lists some key counseling topics for travelers to malaria risk areas. There is no uniform approach to malaria prophylaxis amongst practitioners, though there are some good guidelines. Overseas, generally ignore the advice from fellow travelers and local health providers on the field regarding prophylaxis, since they're often wrong. No anti-malarial guarantees 100% protection. Personal protection against mosquito bites is extremely important. In the case of fever, seek healthcare advice and request malarial testing for diagnosis 
and repeat these tests if symptoms persist. When pregnant, avoid travel to malaria risk areas and particularly to chloroquine resistant areas. If travel is necessary, take prophylaxis. Complication risks are significant for malaria during pregnancy. When infected with malaria, be treated for the infection. Non-treatment can result in a fatality or severe complications. This table lists some suggestions for malaria prophylaxis in pregnancy. It is extremely important that all prophylaxis options be discussed with a clinician before starting any regimen. In chloroquine sensitive areas, consider chloroquine. In areas of low grade chloroquine resistance, consider chloroquine plus proguanol. In high grade resistance areas, consider chloroquine plus proguanol during the first trimester with mefloquine in the second and third trimesters. Chloroquine is likely safe for pregnant women and mefloquine is likely safe after the first trimester. This is a summary of a study published in the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in 2006. There were 32 pregnant women in this study from Eastern Sudan that were diagnosed with uncomplicated Plasmodium falciparum malaria. They were treated with a combination of artesunate and fancidar sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. The mean gestational age at treatment was 29.7 weeks. All patients delivered full-term live babies. None of the mothers died. One baby died on day four of unexplained causes not thought to be related to malaria treatment. There were no miscarriages, stillbirths, or congenital anomalies. The conclusion was that there were no obvious adverse effects due to malaria treatment. Further research is needed regarding malaria treatment in pregnancy. Let's briefly discuss malaria vaccines. This slide summarizes a study of the malaria vaccine RTS-AS01 published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. This vaccine is composed of a circumsporozoite protein plus an adjuvant, AS01, to enhance immune response. This was a phase three trial in seven African countries. The study included 15,460 children, six weeks to 17 months old. Vaccine efficacy for the 14 month study period after the first dose was 50.4%. It was also 45.1% effective in preventing severe malaria. This was another study of RTS-AS01 vaccine published in March 2013. This study included 223 children who received the vaccine at five to 17 months old. The first year efficacy was 45.1%, but declined to 15.9% by four years for an overall efficacy of 16.8%. Anti-circumsporozoite antibodies were higher in vaccinated children than in control children, but the antibody titers declined over the study period. This study raises the question of a need for booster doses to maintain immunity. This is a summary of a study of an attenuated sporozoite vaccine PFSPZ for Plasmodium falciparum published in 2016. This vaccine was developed by Sanaria Incorporated. This study was funded by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. This was a phase one trial. The vaccine provided protection for over one year. Will this immunity last or decline? like the RTS-AS01 vaccine. Much research is still needed regarding vaccines for malaria. 
This slide is adapted from Global Malaria Strategies developed by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID. USAID suggests two major categories of global intervention to support malaria control, technical and research and innovation. Technical interventions would include indoor residual spraying with insecticides programs, the organized timely spraying of an insecticide on the inside walls of houses or dwellings to kill adult mosquitoes before they can transmit malaria parasites to another person, distribution of impregnated bed nets and education on their appropriate usage, insecticide treated mosquito nets hung over sleeping areas protect people by repelling mosquitoes and killing mosquitoes that land on those nets. Intermittent preventive treatment for pregnant women involves the administration of anti-malarial drugs to pregnant women at each prenatal visit, which protects them against maternal anemia and reduces the likelihood of low birth weight and perinatal death in their infants. Diagnosis and treatment programs entails diagnostic testing for malaria to ensure that all patients with malaria are properly identified and receive a quality assured artemisinin based combination therapy, ACT. Seasonal malaria chemo prevention programs is an approach used to prevent malaria among young children in parts of the African Sahel subregion with highly seasonal malaria transmission. It entails the administration of a curative dose of anti-malarial drugs at monthly intervals to children without malaria symptoms in a targeted area over a limited transmission season. Cross-cutting interventions include social and behavioral change communications, operational research, health system strengthening, and surveillance monitoring and evaluation. Research and innovation includes drug efficacy monitoring programs to document the emergence of anti-malarial resistance, research to develop effective malaria vaccines, identify novel insecticide-based vector control tools, and develop new anti-malarial drugs. In summary, malaria is a major global parasitic disease. Plasmodium falciparum is the major cause of severe malaria. Plasmodium vivax is the most common cause of malaria worldwide. Plasmodium vivax and ovale may cause relapses of disease. Chloroquine resistance is worldwide. Pregnancy is associated with increased malaria complications. Prevention measures can be 98% effective in preventing malaria. More research is needed for malaria vaccines. Take your public health practice skills to the next level. Our specialized certificate courses give you an opportunity to work systematically through a public health topic and demonstrate your understanding of that material in a capstone project. Learn more and sign up at ndphtn.com certificates.